we are really fortunate this morning to have Father Nathan Beal. He, Norman, excuse me, I say Nathan, Norman Beal. Um, he is a member of AFM, which is a mission partner with us. He is an also a longtime missionary, uh, particularly in Nepal. He and his wife Beth spent a lot of time there. And I'm going to defer to let him tell you all about it. And I encourage you to come hear him at 1030 as well. The sermon at 815 was worthy of, of hearing and it touched hearts. So please come and, and listen. So, Norman. Thank you so much, Father Don. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks to you for your great love for all the peoples of the earth. Thank you that you loved all of our ancestors enough, Swedes, Norwegians, Germans, French, English, who knows what else, all kind of different groups, Hungarians perhaps, Poles, and you brought them to faith and we've inherited that and yet there's so many people in the world who don't have a great grandmother or grandfather or even a mom or dad who've heard the gospel, they themselves have not. And so for this, we stand before you kind of scratching our heads and wondering why haven't we gotten there yet? And so we ask Lord that you would help us Send your spirit to empower us, not just this parish, but all the ANCNA, the whole Anglican Communion, indeed all of the Christian churches and the world, that we might finish the task that is set before us, which to our chagrin and shame lies unfinished. Thank you for the finished work of you, Lord Jesus, on the cross, for bringing us into redemption and light. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. All right, so I'm getting a little feedback. Am I doing anything wrong? Guess not. All right, so I'm just going to jump right in. But before I do, just a little bit about me so you know who I am. I grew up in New Orleans. My dad was a Presbyterian minister, as was my great-grandfather, as, as well as being a missionary to uh, Comanche Indians in Oklahoma, in that dreadful place where they sent a lot of Indians way back when. I moved up to New York City in the late 70s or mid-70s, and that's when I became an Episcopalian. I'd been Presbyterian up to that point. While I was at Grace Church uh, Episcopal in Manhattan, I met a woman who was studying ballet and I was involved in the arts as well. And we fell in love and got married in that parish. And then we joined the missions committee. She had had a call much earlier to missions as I had, but we didn't know what to do with it. So we joined this committee thinking, well, let's learn more about it. And while we were in that committee, we got a sense from, from God, a very strong sense that he wanted us to go into missions. So we talked to our, our vestry, we talked to the missions committee, we talked to our priest, they discerned that together with us, which is the Anglican way, I'm sure you know that, but we discern as a community, not as individuals. And we went out to uh, California and studied, then we went to Nepal first in 1986 and for long term late 87. And we spent uh, a total of 15 years going and coming in Nepal. And during that time, there's some interesting things that happened following that. I was a parish priest in America, first in Florida and then in Massachusetts, and I'd also done a brief stint in New York State. Um, then we were in Cambodia for two years where I was the priest in charge of a church in the Anglican Church of Cambodia. I don't know if you knew that there is such a thing, but there is. And that was also quite interesting. After that, I was a chaplain for 11 years, and I'm now retired. However, I continue in my role as an abbot of a small order made up of commissioned lay chaplains which is a delight. I never knew anything like that work that way. I didn't know anything about orders, but that's another story, and I'll, I'll have to defer to another time before I tell you about that. But uh, my wife and I, in our retirement, which began about a year and a half ago, are the team pastors to Anglican Frontier Missions. So that's just a little bit about me. So there's a little bit here. I hope you can see this, but AFM, uh, as you know, stands for Anglican Frontier Missions. And... Um, you know, my mouse is not, there we go. And as I told you, we went to Nepal. Initially, there was no Episcopal sending body, even volunteer one, that sent people to places in the world where there were unreached people groups. And that wasn't even on the radar. There was SAMS, and they did great work in South America, South American Missionary Society, as you can figure out from the, you know, the acronym. Um, and that was really good. I, I know, I've known the, the director of, of SAMS for decades. Wonderful, wonderful guy. Stuart. Stuart, what is his last name? Anyway, I'm bad with names. Very bad. So uh, he's my friend, and I can't remember his last name. Wicker, Stuart Wicker. Um, but we ended up going to Nepal with a group out in Seattle. And uh, we lived, I'm going to go off mic just a minute. We lived initially in Kathmandu, and then much later we lived way out here. But we've done treks up here, 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 Everest, 
and lots of other treks. So we, we've been to a lot of parts of Nepal and seen much of it. What happened was this. We worked with an organization that had people in schools, engineering, uh, like you know, hydroelectric and stuff like that, um, medical facilities, including hospitals and health posts up in the mountains, and then community and rural development. When we first went to Nepal, it was hardly any different from how your and my ancestors lived maybe in the 1200s or even earlier. And then we got sent to a little village in southwest Nepal. It was in the mountains, but not high mountains at all. And there, there was no, uh, there was no drinking water uh, available. There was water, but it wasn't in homes. There was no running water, no electricity, phones, roads, stores. It was just very, very primitive. We cooked on a fire. We had to get our food locally sourced. And when they ran into food shortage times, we also ran into food shortage times, which meant uh, it was a, a village that looked very much like this one here, except it wasn't on a mountainside like that. It was in a valley, a circular valley. Um, I don't think my radio signal is working very well. I'm, can I step? Can I do this? Does that work? You're all over there and I'm over here, so. Hello, come. All right, so, um, yes. Am I still on the camera? Yeah, he's moving, he's moving the camera. Oh, very cool. All right, so you're ahead of the game there. All right, so um, Nepal is a country that has mostly Hindus and their religion is, is very uh, temple-based, it's sacrifice-based, it's dark. It might look to some, you know, young people like a really cool thing. It's not cool, I assure you. Um, and there we are when we were much younger. Beth on the left there is my wife. And we went to Nepal and, um, and lived there. And uh, eventually we went out, as I pointed out to you. Oh, by the way, that's our, our two kids that we adopted along the way. They're now adults. I'm Risa, who's from a caste group. And we got her at, at uh, seven weeks as an infant. And then David, who's from a tribal group very much like the ones that we worked with later, called Muggars. And uh, genetically, Beth and I and our daughter are like this, and our daughter and David are like this. Isn't that weird? That she's closer to us genetically, but she has very dark brown skin, and so does he. He looks more Tibetan or uh, Sherpa, um, you know, different, different look. We love our kids. They're great. And so when we left Nepal, you know, we said, hey, half of our family is Nepali. <laughs> Nepal is in our blood, so, and that's been true ever since. So we went out to the west to live in this little village where things were quite rough. I started to tell you a little bit about that. On the left there is the house that we lived in, and there's another photo later on. Thatch roof, stone and mud walls. Uh, as I said, we cooked on a fire. And uh, this was, not, I mean, I've done a lot of backpacking and camping, but I hadn't lived out of my backpack for you know, some years. No, nobody in America does that much, except maybe homeless people, which is a lot harder than it looks. You probably thought how hard it is, but. Uh, and village scenes are, are really quite interesting. So there are a lot of these. Forgive the, the photography here. Some of our photographs turned out not to be as good as we hoped they would be. But life there is all manual labor. Um, on the left is a man pushing down a lever that comes back down and dehulls the rice takes the husk off. You can't eat the rice with the husk on it. And uh, the woman, as it comes down, has to reach her hand in and push some more in before it comes back again and not get it crushed, because it would break your, all your bones in your hand. Quite an interesting thing there, right? So um, as I said, the work is manual. There's an awful lot of stuff that has to be done. Beth tried uh, transplanting the rice from the little uh, green shoots into the rice patties once with them, and she told me, it was backbreaking. She did that because that's women's work. There's men's work, there's women's work, and those, those two things are um, sort of inviolable. And you know, you, you may not like that, but the, our ancestors had some of that too. Um, hopefully we're moving away from that. Here's another view of that house. So you can see the thatch roof, and over there on the right at the top, there's a solar panel. So we had the only solar lights, which were these little fluorescent bulbs about the thickness of my pinky, and maybe about that long that we hung from the ceiling. And they were, I think, eight watts. 
But we had light in our house, and people would come from pretty far away to see this and look at it at night and look up and, can we use your lights too? We said, well, that probably wouldn't work so well because they, they're not battery. There's a battery, but we, you know, it's a marine battery, heavy, heavy battery. Um, and um, here are some, some men w that we knew fixing a net, smoking a chilum pipe. That's, uh, they, they also abuse tobacco there. Uh, and my wife came from a dance background. She studied ballet at Juilliard. And so she thought when the women had this special day where they would all dance together, she would join them. Um, we, while in that village, were asking God daily in prayer, who are the unreached peoples, Lord, that you sent us to Nepal to work among? Now, what are unreached peoples? Unreached peoples, first let's talk about peoples. In the New Testament, the word that's used is ethne. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, when it's translated into Latin, it's hentes. My Hebrew is not good enough to tell you what the word is in Hebrew, I forget. But it doesn't mean, when you see nation, it doesn't mean Iraq or UK or France or Japan. It means, remember this expression when we were, maybe some decades ago, we would say the Cheyenne, Cheyenne nation or the Comanche nation. You recognize that expression? Okay, and what does that connote to you? It's an ethnicity, right? Yeah, it's not a nation state. That's a very modern idea. And in the ancient world, everybody was, was gathered by their ethnicity, their language, their culture. And uh, also, I, I'm sure you've noticed this, but I think this is part of why some, in some cultures, uh, it's true in our culture, in white American culture, that we look at other people and we think secretly, and no one would admit this out loud much, but some people do, we're, we're really better than them because we don't do that terrible thing they do. We do this. Well, they look at us and say the same exact thing. Well, we're better than them because we do this thing and they do that. And that's how cultures are. And that's part of the fall, really. But what is God's purpose for all the peoples of the earth? His purpose is that all of them come into his kingdom. But here's the shocking thing. I hope this shocks you. You probably heard it before, but it still should shock you and make you kind of you know, grit your teeth and lips together, no, teeth together, lips apart, you know. 42% um, of the whole 8 billion people on planet Earth not only don't know Jesus Christ, but they've never met anyone who could tell them in their language, and there is either no one in their language group or so few that it would take a long time to get the task of them hearing taken care of. And so that task remains uncompleted for the last 50 years, right? 2,000 years. And in fact, I heard the story, I was just trying to remember this morning where I heard this, but there's a, a story of a, a man who was in a tribal group that was reached with the gospel, and then when they started to tell the people about Jesus coming to earth, being incarnate, getting crucified, rising from the dead, appearing to his disciples, promising the Holy Spirit, ascending to God and the coming of the Spirit, and then they start going out to accomplish the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and also in Acts 1.8 and other parts of Acts to go and make disciples of all the ethne. The Greek expression in Matthew 28, and you'll hear this at, um, I think it's 1030 service, yes? So I've got to watch my time here. Uh, uh, that um, penta ta ethne is what all the nations in Greek reads in Matthew 28. When Jesus is speaking, he may well have spoken in Aramaic, or he may have spoken in Greek, but probably he spoke in Aramaic, similar to Hebrew, and then it was written down in the Greek, trying to get exactly what he said. You know, the, what is it, the verba epsima or something, the, the, the very words. Do you remember that expression, Father Michael? I don't remember that. Our Father Don. Anyway, whatever it is, the exact words. That's, that's what the gospel writers were trying to get, the exact words by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They, they wrote that down. And all the peoples of the earth means all the peoples. So um, there are these 42% um, percent of the planet Earth population who are in people groups, and I think they say there may be 1,600 of these ethno-linguistic groups. Some of them are very large and others are quite small. I know in Nepal there was a little group of Rautis that are just maybe less than 1,000 people. They speak Rauti language, 
They are nomadic. They live in the forests. In fact, among the other tribes and the caste groups of Nepal, they'll say to their children, don't you misbehave or I'll sell you to the Rauties when they next come through our village. And they make wooden bowls and chests and boxes and all kinds of stuff hand, hand hewn out of this uh, very beautiful hard wood uh, with no nails or screws. They just all fit together with pegs and stuff that they store their rice or their salt or whatever in, or they mix, mix food in. And we have a couple of those things in our household. But anyway, they're these people groups. So this is the thing. So we were praying, Lord, who are we supposed to go to? And for the first three years in Nepal, we didn't, well, actually it was longer than that, it was four years, we didn't get an answer. And I think it was because, remember those photos you saw of the village? Well, we're from Manhattan. I, I grew up in New Orleans, and my wife grew up in northern New Jersey, but it's very similar. We, we grew up in modern American uh, suburban or urban settings where we have all of the conveniences of life, very much like what you experience. And here we are now in this primitive setting. It was quite a shock. But 85% of all the people in Nepal in those years lived in that setting. So if we're going to communicate effectively with them, we can't come there with our Manhattan mindset or our Fayetteville, Georgia, or, or sorry, uh, this isn't Fayetteville, or is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can't come to them with your Fayetteville, Georgia mindset and think you're going to communicate well. They'll, they'll just think you're from Mars. Do you have antenna? Do you, you know, that kind of thing. So you've got to begin to understand their culture and get your toes into the mud of their culture, so to speak. And so that's what those first three years living in that village were doing for us. And when they went through food shortage times, so did we. However, we could purchase, because we had money, some things to eat. And I remember uh, I was doing at that time income generation. My wife was doing non-formal education, which is teaching adults how to read and write. Because a lot of people didn't, in those years did not know how to read and write in Nepal. It's still pretty low, especially among women. So I'd gone way up high on the ridge and then like three villages down the ridge doing some work and I came back and I walked back into the house and I said, I, I know food's really short these days, Beth, what, what do we have for dinner tonight? And she said, tonight we have chickpeas and sesame seeds. That's it. The next night we had an onion that we sliced up and more sesame seeds. The next night we had an onion, a raw onion, and we cooked it. That was it. That was our dinner. And um, my mother-in-law saw a photograph of Beth in our village house during that period of time where her arms had gotten pretty skinny. And I was, I was so skinny, I had to do extra notches in my belt, un unlike I am now. <laughs> I was really skinny. My britches were falling down. But we lived. Some of them died. And a lot of the kids had the quashia core, where the liver swells and it sticks out. It looks like they've got, well, they do. They have a bloated belly, but it's not food. It's a swollen liver. And their beautiful black hair goes orange. I don't know if you've ever seen that. So, you know, these are people who are marginalized, oppressed, uh, living apart from the gospel. Uh, it's just hard to exaggerate how out there they are. And listen, I'm here to tell you, uh, people who live in Muslim countries may not have this equivalent cultural deprivation but they do have the equivalent spiritual deprivation. And they're longing. They may not have the words to know that, and they may not consciously know that, but many of them are longing to find release and freedom and redemption and salvation, and they don't know how to get it. And they read the Quran, but they're, and, and did you know that Isa, Jesus, and Miriam, Mary, is in the Quran a number of times, and not spoken of negatively? But all the imams tell them, no, we don't talk about that. And it's like a question they ought to be asking, why not? Why don't we? I mean, they teach wrong things in, in the Quran about Jesus. But all right, well, I'm getting off on a side, side uh, thing here. Let me move on. So in 1990, after we'd been in Nepal, not quite four years, cumulatively, um, a friend asked me to join a trek with him up into the central higher mountains of Nepal. And he was an American. He was a Baptist guy that I knew and, and I'd worked with. And I said, Mike, um, why are you inviting me up there? And he said, well, I, want, I just want you to come with me. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. I've been living in a village for three years now, and I'm completely convinced that one white face is all you need in a group because it's already so distracting. I mean, I've got blue eyes and lighter colored hair and white skin and a big nose to them, a big nose, because their noses are small. 
And the blue eyes is, you, you know, we kind of think brown eyes are nice, green eyes are nice, blue eyes are nice, but they don't think that. They think blue eyes look weird, and none of them have blue eyes. Um, and they, they call us a very negative word, which basically means fog. And it's kind of like the N-word, maybe a little worse, actually. It's very derogatory. Um, but they talk about our big noses. And I remember one guy asked me, you know, my arms are a little bit hairy, and he said, you are like a monkey. <laughs> you have long hair on your arm. I said, well, what can I say? He said, do you eat snakes? I said, oh, come on, man. You're getting a little weird on me here. <laughs> but so, you know, they, they really don't know who we are as Westerners. We went into a village one time, Beth and myself, and two Dutch women that we had met who were trekking with us, way in the northwest of Nepal. And the kids and the, the moms and the dads and everybody else came out and stood with us there. And they stared at us for four hours. I don't think they'd ever seen Westerners. So, you know. OK, I, I'm going far afield here. I got to move on. I went on this trek with these guys. That's me in that goofy blue hat. And they introduced me to these Tamang people. And in two of the villages that we went to, some of them had become Christian. So this was just kind of starting here and there. The Holy Spirit was at work. How did the Holy Spirit work? Well, one guy went down to India to get a money-paying job and, and came back after a while. And while there, he had met someone who was a follower of Jesus, and he told them about it. And sometimes they would beat the guy or tell him to shut up, you're going to make the gods angry or whatever. They're, they're Tibetan Buddhists, these Tamang people. But um, sometimes they'd listen. And I, I actually sat in a house one day and listened to the guy who had first become a Christian, this is many years later, um, and he told them the story they'd already heard 25 times, but they loved to hear him tell it again, how he got a tract down in India. And he brought it back to the village. It was in his pocket. And he took it out and looked at it and watered it up and threw it away in the corner of the house. A week later, read it again, got angry again, and started to tear it up. And ah, forget it, just threw it down. And this happened a number of times. And finally, he read it. And he went, wow, this is great. Why am I throwing it away? And he began to believe in Jesus. And then his wife did. And then his children did. And then his father did. And then the neighbors did. But there was all this stuff. And that, that's one of the ways it spread. Another way it spread was that um, there were miracles um, among these people, miracles of healing, not only for humans, but the, I, I can't remember if I put this slide in here or not, but there's one picture of me praying for a water buffalo that had an intestinal blockage. I don't know if any of you have farming background, but when a bovine animal, I think, I think water buffalo or bovine, whatever they are there, they have, you know, if they get a, an intestinal blockage and you don't do something internally about it like a vet would do, that animal's going to die. I'm told. I'm not a farming background person. So that morning at like 5 o'clock, we were getting ready to go up to a high pass and go down to another village. And they said, well, we, we, you got to go pray for this baby that's sick. And I kept telling them, you, you can pray too. You don't need the foreigner to pray. But sure, I'll, I'll pray. I'm happy to. And where's the baby? And they said, well, 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 before we go to the baby, there's a water buffalo that's sick. I said, no, we're going to the baby first. Let's keep our priorities right here. And I went, OK. You know. Because they said, we can get another baby, but we can't get another water buffalo. I know that sounds terrible, but that's how they talk. So we prayed for the baby. And then we went over. And I didn't know what to do with this water buffalo. Um, this guy on the left was in our village with a gun and Karna. But there I am praying with some guys who came with a SOMA team, sharing of ministry abroad from US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, UK, and somewhere else. Um, these, these teams would come and help us out. But back to the water buffalo, I prayed for the water buffalo. And by now, it's 530. And we got to get going, because we got to pass to cross, and we have to go down to another village. So we did that, and we went to the other village. And then four days, three days, whatever later, we came back. And the first thing I said when I got into the village, how's the baby? And they said, ah, nobody cares about the baby. What we care about is that God healed the water buffalo. And I said, praise the Lord. And they said, Norman, you know, da, da, da. I said, no, don't do that. I don't have any power to heal a water buffalo. You know I don't. I'm just an ordinary man like you. It's God who did it. You've got to give God the glory here. So they started talking and saying, well, look, if he can heal water buffaloes, could he heal pigs too, maybe? And of course, you know, what about people? I never did find out what happened to the baby, but I do know that other people were healed. Another time, um, one of the guys who later became an Anglican priest prayed with me for a young man who was 15. His father brought him and said he's never spoken. I'm not a follower of Isa, but I hear 
that your Isa God can heal people. I said, well, you know, if you're going to follow, if, if you want to do this, are you going to follow Isa if he heals, heals your son? So, okay, okay, you know, I will, I will do that. So we pray for the boy, and he starts saying gibberish, little, 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 you know, we pray more, and he starts cursing. We bind the spirits, and we pray more, and then he goes back to gibberish, and then we realized he's got a, a congenital development issue, but he's at least talking, and that father is a little short man about this tall, his eyes got this big, it's just so totally shocked. Um, Don, how are we doing on time? Uh, you've got about 20 minutes. Okay, wonderful. So, there are lots of other miracles that happened. Uh, another time, I, I had a very close friend that I knew all 15 years that we were in Nepal who was a Jesuit priest, and we did some ministry together among the Tamangs. And he had done his anthropological research in a little village. I was on this ridge where I'm describing these things that happened here, and he was on a ridge over here. There's, there's uh, the high snows, and so here's a ridge that's, it's just hills. They're only like 15,000 feet high, and that's how they think they're. And he was on this other ridge where there's this little village of Tipling, and he asked um, if he could go somewhere quiet to celebrate Holy Communion, which is what Roman Catholic priests believe is valid. As Anglican priests, we would say never, only when they're two or three, and really preferably three, to serve a, a valid Holy Communion, because it's about the community, right? But never mind, that's, we're going to leave that. But he, he couldn't find a place, so he noticed there was a house up the ridge in Tipling, where nobody lived and nobody went there, so it's quiet. And finding quiet in Nepal, even in the village, sometimes can be a little hard to find because they're kind of noisy. I used to say, you know, I have to get up at 4.30 if I want quiet time because they have their Hindu noisy time that starts about 5.15. Get up and cut the wood. What are, why aren't you uh, collecting water? Why haven't you mucked out the goat shed? You know, and they holler and shout, and then they do their puja, and they do a lot of chanting. Puja is their worship, their Hindu worship. All right. So they said to him, what are you doing up there at that house, Father Cap? And he said, well, I'm celebrating Holy Communion. Holy Communion means, and he explained it to him, and then they kind of went, what? What, what do you eat your body and drink blood? That's, we, don't, we're, we don't even do that. I mean, come on. Really? He said, well, you know, it's, it's the bread that is the body and so on. They, they couldn't get it. But they said, whatever it is, we want to know about it, and we want to do it, because there was a person murdered in that house, and there are evil spirits in that house. Everyone knows it. Anyone who goes there gets sick. Their animals get sick. Something bad happens to them. They break their leg. A child gets you know, stung by a whole swarm of bees, or something bad happens when we go there. So we never go there. But now we've noticed if we go near it, there's no darkness. We go a little closer. There's nothing bad. We go, we, somebody went to the house and said, it's quiet and peaceful now. So what, who is this Isa guy? So he told them about Jesus, and the whole village became Christian. They became Roman Catholic Christians, but we should say, yay, praise the Lord, not, oh, what did they become Catholic for? Never mind, they're Christian. So right before I left Nepal, Cap and I went on a retreat together uh, farther east, high in the mountains, and there was snow, and we, we were up in, in the mountains for a couple of days, and when we were coming back, we meet four wood, woodsmen who are coming up, and they have on very rough clothing and axes over their shoulders. And so uh, I had learned Eastern Tamang, and Father Cap had learned Western Tamang. So that's, that's kind of, you know, divide and, and so on. So um, he said to them in, in Western Tamang, um, have you eaten? You know, sol uh, I said, uh, Falfula, how are you? Uh, we're okay, you know. And uh, where are you headed? And they said, we're headed up there. Where they point with their lips. We're going to cut wood. You can see our axes, you know. I said, okay. And uh, well, where are you coming from? Oh, we're coming from Gatleng, down there. And we could see the village way down on the side of the mountain. And uh, he said, well, what path do you follow? And he knew good and well everybody in that area was Tibetan Buddhist. But they said, well, we follow the path of Isa. And he went, what? How did this happen? I, I, I know your village. I've been there. They, they're all Tibetan Buddhists. He said, no, not anymore. Everyone in that village follows Isa now. Well, how did this happen? Well, the guy from way up there came down and told us, 
Lasso, fafula, so tzidi. You know, this is all the Tama, right? That's the part I learned. And uh, I want to tell you about a new God I know who's really the only true God, and he can heal people, and he can take away your sins. And he's wonderful, and you need to know about him. And this is, ah, get out of here, and you pick up rocks, throwing rocks at him, get out of here. You're going to make the gods angry. Don't come to our village again. Well, he came back another time, more rocks. He came back a third time, and they said, hey, you said your Isa can heal. Yes, yes. Come into our village because we have 700 roofs, meaning, you know, 700 houses. That's how they talk, 700 roofs. And under every roof, at least one person is sick. And from what they said, it sounded like it might be um, typhoid, which I think is contagious. And that's how it spread, you know, through the whole village, whatever it was. And the guy said, well, if he heals you, are you going to follow him? Because I'm not going to come here and pray for you if you, you know. And, and in the end, you, most people would pray anyway. But, but it's an important point to, to get a, a choice. What, what's your choice going to be here? He said, yeah, we'll follow this Isa if he heals. So he came inside the village, no rocks, <laughs> prayed, and they were all healed. And then they said, now we're going to follow Isa. That's the story they told us. So see, these kind of stories were happening all over the place. And I saw with my own eyes amazing things. Even my own wife had a tapeworm cyst that ended up in her brain and it calcified. And when it did, she got seizures. And you know, seizures like that don't go away. It's called neurocysticercosis. We learned all about it the hard way and had the MRIs, et cetera. And we, by then, email had come. So we contacted people all over the world and had them pray for us, for my wife, because she couldn't drive or even ride a motorcycle anymore. She had a little scooter. Because if you're driving, you have a seizure, you're going to fall in the traffic and get killed, right? Maybe. So she had to take Dilantin, which she really hated Dilantin. It made her feel really, you know, yucky. So we, we were praying and we emailed uh, friends in England, America, South America, uh, Anglican friends that we knew in Chile and uh, other, you know, Brazil and so on, and Hong Kong and Singapore and other countries, Thailand. So people all over the world were praying for Beth. We went back to America, took the MRIs that we'd gotten from Bangkok and from Nepal to a specialist in the East Coast, in uh, Pittsburgh. And she looked at him and said, oh yes, this is neurocysticercosis. There's a one centimeter spherical calcified um, tapeworm cyst. The egg in your bloodstream turns into a cyst. And, the, uh, and the, the brain is the wrong place for that to happen. Not it's supposed to be in the intestine. That's what the tapeworm would want. Um, and you know how worms are. Maybe you don't, but that's, anyway. So uh, she said, well look, in about three or four months, get another MR and come see me again and keep on taking that Dilantin. But Beth had stopped taking it because she hated how it made her feel and she had begun to feel better. Actually, up on our roof one day, they have flat roofs and we had prayed and she felt this intense heat on her head. And after that, she slowly began to feel better. So she kind of secretly stopped taking the Dilantin. So we got the MRI, we brought it into her. She was Eastern European. She said, why you waste my time bringing this thing to me? This is stupid. I said, what are you talking about? She said, no, you, why? I am very important doctor, you know. I said, okay, okay. What's going on? Well, this is the wrong MRI, she tells me. And I said, well, no, it's not. Look at the name and the date over here on where, you know. And she said, oh, I see. Oh, it is medical anomaly. I said, what, what are you talking about? And she said, the cyst, it is gone. So, well, that not that what we want? She said, you don't understand. The cyst doesn't ever go away. It's calcified. It's like bone. It stays there. Well, I said, well, shouldn't we be happy? Of course we're happy. You know? <laughs> but it is medical law. I said, no, it's not. It's a miracle of God. Jesus Christ touched my wife's head and took that cyst away. And now she can drive. And even if she wanted to ride a scooter or a motorcycle. And to this day, that was 23 years ago that that happened. And she's had no, no seizures. So see how God, now why doesn't, why don't we see that as much? We do see it here. Well, that's a unfamiliar talk, but let's, let's move on. I've only got a little more time. Uh, so I also taught the Tamang people about the meaning of Holy Communion. And then they said to me in this church where I'm distributing, this is after this event happened, um, I was teaching about the meaning of communion, and one of them said, we, uh, we've never heard of this. We don't know anything about this. Um, this guy was a political leader, I believe, in the community. So he said to me, you will come with the elements, and we will celebrate this here uh, in the next little bit. I said, well, I don't have the elements together yet. 
And he said, oh, all right, tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, everyone will come here, all of you come, everyone come, and he's going to do this. And I said, how about 7? So <laughs> 6 a little early. You know, so he said, okay, okay, late riser, I see. So we had Holy Communion, and um, after everyone received, it was quiet. You could hear a pen drop. And then they started crying and weeping. We've never had this. It's so beautiful. We've never had this before. And then someone starts singing, and then someone else starts singing. Before you know it, it's like the roof is going to lift off the building. They were just singing so loud and full of gusto and excitement. We have had the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We didn't know we could do this. We're, let's do this again. I said, you can do this next week. And they said, no, 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 now. I said, no, you don't need to do it now. You've already had it. You know, you can do it again next week. And then it hit me. Oh, my goodness. This is one of our New Anglican churches. They not only didn't know anything about Holy Communion yet, because it, all of this had just happened, but they don't even have a priest. And you know, we don't believe that a, a communion is valid unless the priest celebrates it. And we do that to protect the sanctity and specialness of it. And there's more to be talked about there. But anyone, anyway, that became one of our issues. So um, all of this ministry among these people who live in you know, the remote areas where they live, who have very primitive lifestyles, uh, began to spread. And as I've already alluded to, the Anglican Church began to emerge. And there's a big story behind that, but I'm not going to go into it. But through these guys back in 1990 and our little team and the work of many other people, the Holy Spirit moved very powerfully among the Tamang people. You see all the scenes of manual labor? Everything has to be done by hand. The weaving, the separation of the grain, the crops, the storage of the grain, the plowing. And they started becoming Christian, which again is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I wasn't the only one involved in it, but I had taken quietly and in the background what's called strategy coordinator role, which was to try to coordinate all the different things. So New Testament translation, Jesus film into Western Tamang and later Eastern Tamang, and then the means of showing the film in a remote area with no bijuli or electricity. Um, teams that, that went out who were short-termers who wanted to distribute tracks. Tracks are, I don't know if you have an allergy to tracks, but I think many people in America feel like, oh, that's just, no, no, no tracks, that's no good. It turns people off. But not so there. They're very widely accepted. And for those who can read, it's great. And then they have the cartoon ones that don't have any words. You, you see what's happening from the pictures. But then people look at pictures, and they don't know what the picture is. They've never seen pictures. And you think, no, look, that's a man. That's a woman. Don't you? And they go, no, I, don't, I just see a bunch of funny lines there. I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. They're, they're not, how would you call that? They're not visually literate. They see a photograph, and they don't know what it is. And you say, that's you. And he goes, I look like that? Because he doesn't have a mirror. He's never seen his face, you know? Anyway, so many things different there. So I'm just telling you this kind of jumble of different stories and showing you all these photos. But I, I began to go and teach and teach and teach. And then I thought, this is crazy. I can't teach all these people. So I developed a deal where I began to teach all the leaders. And I'd have them come. Eventually, instead of me going to them, I had all of them come into Kathmandu, where we'd have a place where they were separate from the village and worrying about the water buffalo or the crops or cutting the firewood or whatever it is. And we'd have these teaching sessions, bring teams. Some of them would go out there with me. Some would, sometimes we'd stay in Kathmandu. As time went on, we stayed in Kathmandu more often. And uh, that's the Archbishop of Southeast Asia who came with me. And I worked for him. I, I actually became the dean of Nepal, the Anglican Church in Nepal, for the first 10 years of its existence. And we had all these things going on. So it was really exciting. And so I felt like, not because, if anything, in spite of my failures and the bad choices I sometimes made, or the uninformed choices, or the culturally insensitive choices that I made, that we were able to just do this amazing stuff because the Holy Spirit was doing it. See, it's not you or me. He uses us, and it is you or me. But it's, ultimately, it's not really us. It's him through us doing this stuff. And it's because of God's great love that these things could happen. So let me just shift a little bit now. Years have gone by. I was later a parish priest for about 10 years and then a, a, a chaplain at a veteran's home for 11 years. Now I'm in retirement, and my wife retired as well. So what we're doing now, 
because we're too old to do that stuff anymore. That's, that's, you got to be tough to do these things. But there are a lot of people out there who can do it. Maybe when you were younger, maybe some of you in this room are young enough to still do it. I see a couple of young faces here. But um, we realized that our experience as missionaries, and then in the parish setting where I was the priest and Beth was the priest's wife, and we did a lot of stuff together with youth and children and with adults and alpha and all kind of stuff. And, and then the time while I was a chaplain, Beth and I did a lot of inner healing and physical healing and other kinds of healing with people in prayer settings. Um, and we had been doing that before as well. So we've, we've got a lot of experience. So what we're doing is going to countries. Now, this is being recorded, so I'm not going to tell you where we went. But we went to somewhere in Central Asia and saw a family with six boys. I called them the Band of Brothers. You ever see that thing uh, that's on, t on the television? Because they, they love each other so much. They're sweet boys. And we prayed with them. Five minutes. Thank you. Um, we prayed with them. We spent time with them. We heard their stories about what's going on. And then we went on to another city in West Asia and met with a single guy who's been there almost 10 years now. And he's got excellent language of that country and doing amazing stuff. And these are all AFM missionaries. And then we went to another city in that same Western Asian country and uh, saw a family with three children. And this person had done a master's degree in their language, which I just tip my hat to, because that's really hard to do. But they've been there about seven years. So, you know, that's really cool. And there's another family, I, I can, well, I can't really. Another family that were in a country that's been war-torn. It's a Muslim country, and so you, that narrows down some of the options. But they had to leave because the war was so bad. And um, they've been in America, and they're getting ready to go back to the region. And they have six children also. But we've visited them twice here in America because they, they had to bail out, as I told you. And, um, and we pray with them. We talk with them. We play with their kids, read books to their children, tell them, uh, you know, hey, we'll watch your kids. Go out for dinner tonight or we'll take them all out for dinner, or we'll do take out and bring it there, because with six kids, it's kind of hard to go out and eat. You know, so anyway, we do all these kind of things, and that's, that's kind of our role now. We're pastors to the missionaries. And so I just want to leave you with a few things. AFM, what do we do? We are uh, working in these countries. I don't know if you can make those out there, but you can see North Africa, the Middle East, and then Asia. Right now, we don't actually have anybody on the ground in China, because they've been kicking people out pretty systematically. And we do have some people getting ready to go to Japan. We've got people in other places as well. Um, but AFM is a number of things. It's prayerful, like you are here in this parish, because I see how you pray. And that's really good. But we're collaborative and relational. Relationships are very important. And I hope that we in AFM can continue to build our relationship with you all. Or I'm a Southerner. I can say y'all. Um, that's something we want to do. We're relational, collaborative, but we're also strategic. We try to, try to think, not just tactically do any good thing, but no, what's the most important set of good things to, to think about? And you know, the Holy Spirit, it's not like the Holy Spirit doesn't know what he's going to do beforehand. A lot of people think that. Not true. The Holy Spirit can show us what would be the most strategic thing to do in any given people group setting so that they become a reached, not an unreached group. And then finally, we try to do things that are indigenous. In other words, we're not trying to make Americans out of them, but to understand their culture. By the way, go back and read the 39 articles. Article 34 talks about that. I'm not even going to say a word about it. You go read it. Um, but also in AFM, what do we want to ask you to do? You'll hear this in the sermon, but we'd ask that you would um, pray. And we already talked about that. But missionaries need your prayer support. Those people in Rwanda that Father Don has gone to, and some of you perhaps have, have accompanied him, they need your prayers. The people that Father Michael has visited in India, and that Bishop Dutta, I think it is, they need your prayers. And they're facing spiritual warfare that's worse than what we face here. A lot of what we face here is kind of hidden. But there, it's not hidden. It's blatant, and it's bad, really bad. So they need your prayers. But so do the AFM missionaries who are working where there aren't any Christians often, or there, there are so few, and they're badly persecuted. So you can pray, 
you can grow in your understanding of unreached people groups. Look up stuff on the internet. Go to the library and ask them to get this book that they probably won't have, but maybe some library around will have it, or buy the book. Take the perspectives course. So pray, grow, grow in your knowledge, and then grow in your involvement. Not everybody can go, but you can be part of a team of someone who is going by supporting them, praying for them, strengthening them. Pray, grow, give. You're already doing that financially and in prayers. And then finally, either go yourself or again, send somebody else. So those are the things that I'd like to leave with you. And then from Habakkuk, I hope you read the Minor Prophets. You know, the, the prayer book has morning prayer and evening prayer. You can read through most of the Bible every year. It's really fun. I highly encourage you develop a habit of doing morning prayer and evening prayer. Uh, but this is from Habakkuk. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe. Do we have time for a question or two, or do we pretty much need to wrap it up? Sure. Okay. Questions, comments? What yeah. language did you speak, and how did you learn it? We, we learned to speak. The question was, what languages do we speak, and how did we learn them? Beth and I learned Nepali, and we had learned to do this because when we first, first wanted to go to Nepal, the internet didn't even exist yet, at least not in its common form that we know now. So there wasn't really anywhere to study it. We, went to, we had uh, library rights at UCLA and USC in Southern California when we were out there. But there was nothing about language, uh, really nothing at all about Nepal. It was just kind of this unheard of place. So um, we went to Nepal and we did something that we had learned at Fuller Seminary, which is you go around every day to 50 shops and um, you have a little card that the guy at the first shop has helped you write in Nepali and in English, hi, my name is Norman, I'm from America, I would like to learn your language. Would you help me? And you repeat that 50 times the first day and the second and the fifth day. You do it five days every week. And it might take a couple hours to do that. But see, it's very relational, right? Because they would laugh because we say it so wrong. <laughs> and they would become our friends and help us. So we're getting, we're saying we're here and you're here. You're the one in charge, not me. And then the next week, we'd develop another thing, and then we'd say what we said the first week. The third week, there'd be a third little dialogue. Can you help me learn the colors? What's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet? Can you help me with the numbers? Can you tell me what about men, women, children, grandpa, but family relationships and all this stuff? So we learned Nepali. And uh, when I go to speak Nepali, I don't think of words. I, th I remember our conversations and whole sentences come out of my mouth without me even trying to compose the sentence. And that's how we think in English. So to me, that was successful. And I can preach for two or three hours, which is a common sermon length in Nepal, in Nepali. But I also learned Eastern Tamang, because we, we were reaching the Western Tamang, but the Eastern Tamang, whose, whose language is separated because the verbs are all different, is actually a different language, even though it sounds so similar. I mean, the greeting is still, lasso, how have you eaten, falfula, uh, how are you? Sol Ji, what's the other way around? Sol Ji is have you eaten? Um, but you know that, that was when we went to Cambodia. I didn't do so well in Cambodian. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm sure there are other questions. Ask me after the next service. We need to stop it there. May we pray? Yeah. Almighty God, thank you for this time to share. I pray that you will bless all the women and men in this room and this parish and their efforts in Rwanda and India and supporting AFM and other mission endeavors. And may we grow together in the, the per pursuit of that thing that you wish us to do so that the end could come. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for your time. It's a great pleasure to be here with you.